So last, not last week, last time we were together, we've skipped a couple weeks. Last time we were together, we were in Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. And we talked a little bit about Abram um, and God changed his name and made the statement to him, walk before me and be thou perfect. And we talked about what that meant and <clears throat> about the five times in those verses where God made the statement that I will and how powerful that is if you get a hold of it that this covenant that God has made with us, he is the one doing most of the work. Amen? And I, I, I'm, I'm going to leave that alone. I, I, I tend to want to go back into that just a little bit, but I really feel like I need to hit this other part about Abram or Abraham tonight. We're going to go back even further in his life, but... <clears throat> As a part of the transformation that Abraham went through, um, I, I, tonight I want to go back even further in his life and see if we can see something else that I think is important. If I have a title for tonight, if you're, if you're big into titles or want to write those down, um, I would call it Answer the Call or Answer the Invitation. I like the invitation better because... Uh, You'll understand that when we get a little farther down tonight. But about answering the invitation. How many ever been invited to something and you didn't go? And he's been invited to something you didn't want to go to. And so you had all kinds of excuses to come up with to not go, right? And uh, we all do it. We've done it in one way or the other. Um. And then again, we talked Sunday a little bit. I'm, I'm just kind of stuck in Abraham right now or, or dealing with Abraham and around Abraham lately. Talked Sunday a little bit about our kids and that our kids do what we do. This thing's still got quite a bit of ring in it, Spencer. Um, about our kids do what we do, not necessarily what we say and how important that is. And we compared Sunday, we compared Abraham and Isaac somewhat. Um, but I want to I want to deal with Abraham. Go with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter twelve. Genesis chapter twelve, verse one through four. This is a famous set of verses. It's been preached millions of times, and most of you can probably quote these verses. But I'm I'm setting this up for where we're going to go. It says, "Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house." to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, I will curse him who curses you. Excuse me. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham, Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Last week we talked about when he was 99 years old and that God made him a promise. We're backing up to 75. He's a young man here, right? 75, he's a young guy. And God speaks to him, and it says that he had said to him, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, I'll make your name, I will make you a great nation, I'll bless you, make your name great, and blessing I will bless, and I will bless those who bless you, curse them that curse you, and on and on. This is where God speaks to Abraham to start this journey. And <clears throat> I would call it the invitation. This is where he starts this whole leave your father's house stuff. Leave your country. Leave your surroundings. Leave what's familiar um, and go to a new place kind of stuff. How many has ever had God speak to you and it felt like that? <laughs> Pack up and move. Give it away. Walk away. Um, Cassie and I have done it several times in our life. I remember God used this very verse um, with me uh, when he told us to give her dad's church away to the Spanish church um, in Arkansas one time. He said, 
this is what I want you to do, and I want you to go to a place. I had no idea. I, we, we had settled in. I mean, things were rolling. Our business was doubling every year. Church was good. Everything was doing good. And then I just walked in my office one day, and the, the Spirit of God come on me, and this verse just starts rolling through my head. And, he, and I sat down and opened up my Bible and, and began to read it, and he said, this is what I want you to do. And I'm like, okay. I had no idea that it was going to entail a whole lot more than I thought than just, I, I had no idea it was going to have a whole lot more to do with just giving a church away and walking away from that. I didn't realize I was going to walk away from everything. And um, I will have to admit, I didn't do it by choice. I didn't take the invitation. I had to be drug <laughs> part of it. And, and those of you that know us know our, our whole story. But... You understand that. But go to this new place kind of stuff. And I don't want to take away from Sunday where we talked about Isaac staying in the spot he was staying in. Isaac was, Sunday we talked about how um, God told Isaac to stay in this spot and it was a hard place and, and staying in that certain place and that what he was going to do with him and he was going to bless him in that place. How many understand their seasons in this walk? And when God invites us to come walk with him and God invites us to take this journey with him, there's going to be seasons. There's going to be change. There's four seasons in the natural. It's not always going to be harvest time. We're in the, we're in the middle of fall harvest right now. Everybody's working in there. I mean, crops are good. Prices are great. Everything's wonderful. And that's a great time of year. You start thinking about all the stuff you can pay. Things are good. We're going to get ahead, build a new shop, get a new combine, whatever we're going to do. And that's great. And then... You have another season, or you go through a drought year, or, or whatever it is. And, and so there's seasons, and this whole transformation thing that we're, we're dealing with this year in this church and, and, and moving and transitioning and this walk by faith kind of stuff, it's more than just a prayer and a hold on kind of Christianity. So many people have this mindset with Christianity that you, that you just pray a prayer and you punch your ticket to go to heaven and then you hang on till he comes. There's a lot of people think that way and feel that way in their walk with God. And it's, well, I prayed the prayer. I know I'll go to heaven someday. But the rest of my life is just going to be like hell on earth until Jesus comes or till I die and, and finally get out of here. I mean, that's, that's a pretty pitiful way to live. Why would a guy, why would God go to all the trouble of coming, sending Jesus for us to just barely make it through life and just endure this thing till we can get out of here? When he said, I've overcome the world, amen, and he's in you. He's, he's inviting us to take this journey and walk this walk like he did and, 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 and live out this covenant relationship we have with him. But it's more than just a prayer and a hold on kind of Christianity. It's more than a, than a striving to be. I talk to so many people that tell me all the time that they're just, I'm just really trying, Pastor. I'm just trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. And I say, what are you trying to be? What are you trying to do? And so many people are, are, are trying to please this God or they're trying to live up to a standard or they're trying to, to live up, uh, according to someone else's life or this other person that they know to live like them or to be as good as them or, or what someone's told them they need to be like. And I'm all for moving forward. I'm all, all for self-improvement and getting better and gaining and growing and building. I love that. But when it's strife, and you're striving to do something or to be something and you don't even really know what it is or you're, you're fighting something in the back of your mind or, or something that's in your heart, that's where it's wrong. The Bible says where there's envy and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. Where there's envy and strife. So like when, when people are envying someone else or they're envying someone else's life or they're envying... Uh, being like someone else or something like that, where there's envy that causes strife because you're striving and there's confusion and every evil work. I, that's pretty broad. That's a pretty broad, broad brush. You know what I mean? And so I, I, I really struggle. I really encourage people to quit striving. And it's not that you don't try or it's not that you don't try to be better or, or keep, keep walking out this life. It had nothing to do with that, but it's when it becomes this unhealthy striving to be something. Um, 
This, this Christianity is more than a work, working for approval. A lot of people I talk to, they, they, they feel like they're working so God will be proud of them or God will be happy with them. How many know God is already happy with you? Because he sees you through Jesus. He can't even see you. He sees you through Jesus, and he's well pleased. Though, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, and all things have become new. So either you're in Christ or you're not. And if you're in Christ, how many know that's what he sees? Amen? And so you don't have to work for his approval anymore. And so there's no more... Um, I don't know what that note meant. But there's, there's, there's no more of that when you, when you, when you accept this invitation. There, there's something deeper to this walk. There's a deeper calling. There's something else that Abraham did or Abram did. He's still Abram at this point that Abram did. And it's called a walk of faith. It's called a walk of faith. God just invites us in this Christianity thing that we're doing, in this relationship thing that we have with God. It's like, come on, take a walk with me. Remember the one scripture that says, are you, are you weary and heavy laden? Come away with me. The message version says it like this. It says, come away with me. I'll teach you how to take a real rest. Come walk with me. I'll teach you. the." the it goes on and talks about the, the rhythms of grace. The rhythms of grace. How many know the Bible says grace upon grace? Grace upon grace. That doesn't just mean I got away with that one and I got away with that one. How many know that there's, there's grace in our life when, when we do, uh, he gives us grace in the situation, grace to endure the situation, and then there's grace to get through this situation, and then there's grace that teaches me how to, how to deny ungodliness. There's all these different sides of grace, but how many know it just isn't about grace? Lately, I keep hearing this phrase, but grace and truth. That's what Jesus came to show us and talk about was through grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so he invites us to go on this walk. He invites us to go on this journey uh, and a life where our steps are ordered and realizing that there is a greater plan or design. And some people find that. And it used to be, and, and I don't want it to sound, I don't want to sound, um, I don't even know what the right word is for this. We used to think they were kind of out there, people that would take this journey, people that would accept this invitation, people that would walk this walk like Abraham did to where it's like whatever he tells me to do, just do it. But I'm finding that there's more and more people that really want to go on that walk. There's more and more people that are looking for that very journey because they're realizing that, there's, that, that with life, you know, all as there is is making money, eating, having stuff, and what relationships seeing a lot of things you can go see the sites you can do those kinds of things but life's really pretty simple if you if you're just all about the the natural things but some people and more and more people are finding this and wanting this there's no way to stress the importance of living out this kind of life and this is what i'm, I'm trying to get into where, where we're going tonight there's there's no way to stress the importance of living out this kind of life especially in front of our kids and even our friends, and, I'll, and I'm, I'm going to go with it now. Luke chapter 14, verse 15 through 24. It says, Now when one of those who sat at the table with him, Jesus, heard these things, he said to him, he tried to make this big statement, he said, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus is preaching the kingdom. And, and people even in that day, they didn't even get what he was talking about. But he said, then he said to him, Jesus says to him, a certain man gave a great supper and he invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. And I want to stop right here because most people preach this as the second coming when Jesus invites everybody and nobody shows up and they got excuses. It has nothing to do with it. This is about a kingdom understanding. This is about God inviting us into this relationship and walking this thing out and living in a place, a certain place in the evening. It's the third meal of the day. It is a restful place. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. 
the first said to him, I've bought a piece of ground, and I must go see it. I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another says, I have married a wife. Now he's blaming his wife. And therefore, I cannot come. My wife won't let me come tonight. I can't go because my wife. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. And then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, King James says highways and hedges, and bring in here, I'm sorry, we'll get there in a minute, in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded and still there is room. So they go out, the guy goes out and gets all the halt and the lame, the blind, the people that nobody else would want, the people that, that typically are... Uh, are considered uh, not as valuable, whatever. He invites them in, and they come, and there's still room at the table. And then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. None of these people ever tasted what could be. And I don't know about you, but I just, I, I, I live the Christianity thing in every way that I told you about. First, my, my whole concept of Christianity was you, you get saved, you believe in Jesus because you're afraid you're going to go to hell someday. And so you pray a prayer, you confess, I'm a sinner, please forgive me so I don't go to hell someday. And then I, I was under the understanding that if, if Jesus showed up and I had any kind of thought or any kind of sin in my life that I wouldn't make the rapture. And I heard enough in time preaching and saw the charts across the stages and, and different things like that and talking about red moons, but I never paid attention enough to really understand all of it and put it together. All I knew is when there was a red moon, that means something was really bad and it must be the end of the world. And so as a little kid, when there would be a full moon and it would be kind of red, I would cry myself to sleep because I was scared to death I might have a thought or I might have sin in my life that would keep me from making the rapture and God might leave me and then burn me forever. And then as I grew older... I began to mature and, and, and have some more understanding. And then I realized after I wrecked my life, God still loved me. And God's call had never left me. And God wasn't going to leave me. And then I ran on to a verse of all things that said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And I thought, wait a minute, that's what I've been told all my life, that he's going to leave me. But he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And then it's not your righteousness, it's mine. The, my righteousness, the good things, that striving, and all this good that I could do, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. If you really translate it, you guys know what that means, most of you, the rag that it's talking about. And I, so I, I, I just keep walking this walk and this journey. And then I realized, and I felt like the apostles where it said that the love of God constrained them. I realized that if he didn't leave me then, and it wasn't about my perfection, and I didn't have to strive that he loved me anyway, it began to grip me, and I began to want him more that way than I ever did before. And I began to realize, how many know it's hard to resist love? It's just flat out hard to resist it. Matter of fact, the Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. This whole thing's based on faith. Fear would be the opposite of faith, right? So if we can get the love right, how many know the faith will fall right in line? I had somebody ask me recently, why is it so easy to love some people? And my answer is simple, <laughs> because they love you. When somebody loves you and treats you good, it's hard not to love them back. Amen? And so... If you ever get a hold of and get a glimpse and an understanding of God that God is love and that he loves me this much, and why would he do that in the first place? I went through all that phase. Why would he love me? How can he still love me when I'm having these thoughts or when I'm angry at something? And because he's a, fa he's a good father. He realizes that some of the things that I'm angry at or that I'm struggling with is because my fear and insecurity. It doesn't mean that I'm evil. 
He, does, he realizes I've still got some hurts or some issues that I haven't dealt with in my life, and he loves me past them anyway. He knows it's just like us when we raise our kids. We realize what they're going through. They don't know it. Cassie and I watched our grandkids um, yesterday, all day. We had to be out there at 6 in the morning, and uh, Jess and Brandon had a bunch of appointments all day. and So we had all the kids, and they were all sick. I don't know how she does it. There was two of us, and she's usually there all day by herself. But how many know when you got a bunch of little kids, and they're all sick, and then they're tired, and then it's nap time, they can just like almost have a whole other personality. And it's the end of the world for them over the smallest little things. But we as adults and parents, we see it, we understand. We understand you don't feel good, you got something going on, and it's just bad, or you're tired. That's how God is. And when you realize that he loves me this much and that, 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 he, that he stuck with me through all the times when he should have left me. I mean, I, I've prayed. I mean, I've just looked up going down the road and said, God, why don't you kill me? Why don't you flat out strike me dead right here with what I just thought? Or the, 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 where is this desire coming from that I have or whatever? And, and then you, you get to that place, you realize he's not leaving me. He hooked on to me because he saw something or he created in me something from the foundation of the world. And he said, I want a relationship with you. And matter of fact, your Bible says in Galatians that, that he had an intimate relationship with us from the foundation of the world. That's pretty heavy. And when you get to that point, you, I don't know about you, but I couldn't resist the walk. I did all the striving. Man, we went to church eight nights a week. You know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Tuesday night, prayer night, Thursday night, work night, practice night for worship, three services on Sunday morning, Sunday night service, Wednesday service, led worship three times, did three services Sunday morning, just heard them in, heard them out, and here we go, and do all this stuff, and just work, and I'd go up and lay in the sanctuary at night, pray in the middle of the night, God, let me get the right songs, please let me have the right songs for worship. Like, if, if I begged him enough, he'd finally tell me. And then I realized, you know, he'll tell me just going down the road. Matter of fact, if he doesn't even tell me, if I just get up and start worshiping, he'll show up anyway. See, I had all these misconceptions that I had to, I had to do all this stuff so I could make sure I heard and I could make sure I was going to be on point. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think God honors our intent, don't you? When I, when I know somebody wants to do something for me or wants to, wants to help me, I can't help but appreciate that. But you go, you go through this deal, and, and, and God invites us to go on this journey with him. But so many people think because of their misconception of God, they don't want to go on the journey. So they start making all these excuses because they've just never seen him in that way. And they don't realize how much he thinks of them and how much he, of a, the relationship he wants with them and what he wants to do all through their life. It doesn't mean that he just wants to give you this perfect little life and you'll never go through things. That is absolutely not Christianity. Matter of fact, it's the hard things that we go through that make the biggest difference. Where people see Him shine through our life. But I tell people this all the time. Don't ignore the invitation because you'll miss out on the ride of your life. You'll miss out on the ride of your life. A life that others will want. That, that one verse where he says, go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come. The word compel there doesn't mean to beg them. It doesn't mean to beg them to come to church. Try to get them to come to church with you and try to get them to see this. No, it, it, what that literally means is live your life in a way that they want what you got. And you don't, even have to, you don't even have to fight to do that. You just go on this ride with him and you'll, you'll live this thing out right in front of everybody and they'll watch you and you're not even trying to do it. You're just living in this relationship with him and they begin to see you and I go through these things and live life and, and, and whatever it is, we go through things, uh, we experience things, we have joy when we shouldn't have joy, we're able to make it when we shouldn't make it. Whatever it is, they see that and they begin to want that. I told this story, I think, years ago here. But we were going to a, a church, that church I was talking about where we were so busy. And every Sunday night, we would just be wore out. And we, a bunch of us young couples had small kids, about like Jess and Brandon. We, uh, a bunch of us that were working in the church and stuff. And so every Sunday night, we would go to Village Inn after church. 
and we would just sit around. Kids would play together. Most of the time, the kids would fall asleep, and we would just laugh and hoop and holler and have a good time. And I went into work one day. I was still working at the electric company there, too. And I went into work one day, and one of the guys I work with come up to me, and he said, man, he said, I saw you guys at Village Inn last night. And I said, you did? And he goes, I told my wife, that is the happiest bunch of people I've ever seen in my life. I said, really? He didn't know all the stuff we were all going through. All of us, all these young families, I could, tell you, I could just sit here tonight and tell you a list about that time of what all these people were going through. But we were just living life, and we were loving each other, and we were having a good time, and God was showing up, and we were having good services. And God was healing people, and people getting saved and, and moving and things. But he said, I just told my wife, those are the happiest bunch of people I've ever seen. He said, whatever they've got, I want it. And I thought, you have no idea. Amen? That's what I mean when people will see your life and they'll want what you got and, and you're not even trying to do it. You're just living because you're on this journey with God. You're just doing whatever he's telling you to do and, and it's a ride. What a ride because it looks like to me Abraham may have seen something somewhere in his life why did God just all of a sudden, you go through Scripture and nobody's living like this, and then all of a sudden Abram appears on the scene and he's this guy that just walks with God and does all this stuff. I think in his life, there may have been somebody else in his life where he saw this leave this place kind of thing somewhere. And I think it's his dad. Back up with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 11, the last two verses before chapter 12. Before the famous verses of chapter 12, 1 through 4, are these two verses. And it says, And Terah, his dad, took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sariah, and his son, Abram's wife, his son Abram's wife. And they went out with them from Ur of Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan. Everybody say the land of promise. That's the promised land. And they came to Haran, and they dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. God had already spoke to his father. Abram had watched his father begin to leave the place that he had told him to leave. He watched him leave or go. He left a place called Ur. I, I always get into names. You guys know me. I get into names and the meanings of the names because it's, it's fun to write the meaning out beside them and then reread that verse with the meanings of the names. So I'm going to do it with this one. He left Ur, which means a flame or the seat of the moon god. And if you really understand about Abram's life and his father's life, they, they, they were worshipers of idol idols. They were idol worshipers. They were, they would even uh, been into human sacrifice before, things like that. But it says he left Ur or the, 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 the seat of the moon god. <laughs> the uh, horoscope readers, the different things like that. He left that kind of a place, the Ur of, Cal, of the Chaldeans, which means clod breakers. How'd you like to be a clod breaker? So he left this place, the clod breakers, and he headed to Canaan. But his father stopped at Haran, which means a dried up place or a parched road. He stopped there and he stayed there until he died. Without getting bogged down into names and stuff like that, uh, just look at this picture with me if you would, and then I'll let you go. You and I cannot afford to stop along the road of dry places and stay there till we die. I'm not talking about like we talked about Sunday. You're going to have to set that aside for a minute. Because how many know on this walk that we go on with God, there'll be dry places and there'll be wet places. There'll be good times and there'll be bad times. It doesn't matter. You don't stop in any of them. Amen? Say don't stop. <laughs> that needs to be in the chat somewhere probably. You need to not stop. Because it's not about the place, but it's so tempting for us to stop in the hard times or stop in the dry places and stay there. 
I wish there was more about his dad and about this situation that I could find because I would like to study that out a little further. But I, I don't want to get away from what we started with. With Abram saw his dad be willing to leave when God spoke and to start on this journey. And what I really feel like God impressed me with today was our kids are depending on us to not only live by example of leaving the old life and worshiping the moon, so to speak, and going or heading towards a promised land or a life that God has promised for us. Our kids are depending on us. If no one else or nothing else in life, our kids are depending on us to keep going. It's good that they see us start, but how many know it would be better if they'd see us finish? It's good that Abram saw his father start to follow God and start to believe and start to walk with God, but it would have been, it couldn't have not been better had he seen him continue on. Abram saw his dad leave, but he never saw him make it in. So I've got in my notes, don't stop. Now, the flip side of this is we cannot ride on the coattails of our parents either. Even if our parents were the ones that kept going, even if our parents kept walking by faith and lived out this life and they saw great miracles in their life and they saw God do all this kind of stuff, how many know you and I can't live on the coattails of our parents, of their faith? We can't live on the coattails of their, of their strength, of their financial strength, we have to have our own life. You can't survive on your parents' revelation. You and I can't survive. Our kids can't survive on our revelation either. You hear me say this all the time. I want my kids to go way further than me. I want it to compound. I do believe that every generation should, should succeed the, the last. Everybody agree with that? You don't have to. I'm just asking. I believe that we should get better. I think as a, as a parent, when I look at my parents and their life, they gave me the best of what they could at the time. And we all need to get to that place and understand they all give us the best of what they knew how. Instead of focusing on the parts that they didn't give us, how many realize the older you get, they didn't know how to do some things. And I want the same mercy given to me from my kids as they grow older and I look back now and I realize some of, some of the stupid things we did as parents. I want them to give me mercy, so I'm going to sow mercy to my parents. Amen? I look back and I realize they did the best they could with what they knew how at the time, and I am thankful. And so I'm going to take everything good that they gave me in my life, I'm going to compound that and put that with everything in my life and my experiences, and I'm going to keep walking. And I'm going to keep living this thing out. And hopefully, it'll get better for my kids. My kids are at a place in their life spiritually at the age they are now when I didn't get to until I was in my 30s and some even in my 40s. And I look at them, my grandchildren, when I look at them now, and this is nothing about me, I'm just trying to encourage you about this walk and why it's so important to go on this journey with God and not just live this Christianity of, well, we're going to go to church on Sunday and we go through the motions and, we, you know, God really never moves. Yes, He will. He'll take you on a ride you never imagined. He'll allow you to see things. I've, I've, seen people, I've seen him heal people physically. I've seen miracles financially in my life and other people's lives all around me. I've been through hard times. I've lost everything a couple times in my life. I've seen him give it all back double over and over. He can open a door and one signature, whew, your whole life can change in, in any kind of way. But I wouldn't trade this ride for anything because it would be so boring without it. The important thing that we need to show our kids is how to be hungry. This is not to throw rocks at previous generations. I think I already I pretty much covered that. Not to throw rocks at previous generations at all or to say that they weren't good enough. I'm not going there. What I'm saying is you and I have to answer the call or the invitation to the journey ourselves. You can't ride on your parents' faith. You can't ride on my faith, your pastor's faith, your friend's faith. You got to get your own faith. You got to take your own journey and go with him. The principle that I'm after the evening, this evening is this. We have to answer the call. We need to answer the call. There's room at the table. God wants them all. 
the call to follow him, that voice, that word, that leading, that there's something in me, that there's more to life than this. There's more to it than just this. And there is. There really is. It's the ride. And that's all the things he's going to do through you. You're going to speak into somebody's life. You, he, he'll have you speak a word to a teenager sometime, and you'll feel like it's just a word of encouragement. And it will set them in motion. It'll set them on a trajectory for something that will change generations. I told you the story about the guy saying something to me when we were hauling hay when I was 10 and how that confidence went in me and stuck with me and it, it changed my whole attitude and it wasn't until later but when I was a teenager and a junior and senior in high school that I had another situation that went the other direction and killed that that what that other person had instilled in me I allowed the other one to take that from me and then I struggled for years and years to ever get that confidence back you and I have the opportunity to speak into people's lives like that every day not just our kids but people all around us that voice, that word. It's been said that, and I, I heard Paul White say this today. I was listening to a podcast. It's been said that biblical wealth and power usually is squandered by the third generation. Now think about this with me. Have you ever, have you ever, ever heard the, the philosophy or heard the facts about when people like win the lottery and how, how it destroys their life and how fast that money goes away? Or you get... Uh, Athletes, professional athletes that grow up in the hood and they become professional uh, athletes of some sort and they make millions of dollars. Boxers have done the same thing. Evander Holyfield is one of them. I know quite a bit about his story and, and stuff. They, they have all this money, but they, they've never been taught how to handle it. It's, it's, it's been new to them. And so many of them lose it or squander it. But watch, watch this and see if this doesn't have some truth to it. Biblical wealth and power, I'm talking biblically, think about Bible stories with me, usually is squandered by the third generation. Let me just give you a few examples. We had Moses, and then we had Joshua. Where's the third one? Nothing after that. Then we had Elijah and Elisha. You don't hear much after that, do you? David. And he had his son, David was this awesome man. He was a man after God's own heart. And he raises Solomon. And then who do you hear after that? Just think about that. Biblically, this happens a lot. It happened most of the time. By the third generation, I could name you some prophets and some priests that their sons did evil. Their, some of the, some of the, one of the guy's sons were having sex with people at the door of the temple. And here he was this mighty man of God, and in one generation it went that way. Where did, what after that? It usually takes three generations. <laughs> we'll deal with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the one we're on, this family. But I can even show you some stuff in this one. You think about, we talked about Sunday, how Abraham and Isaac had so many similarities. You know, the blessing they were, the king Abimelech. Both of them had a king, Abimelech. Both of them lied about their wife being their sister to save their life. They did so many similar things. And then you got Jacob. There's a third one. It's, it's going downhill. Jacob had this concept that he, was a, that he believed is in the meaning of his name, which was trickster and deceiver. He'd bought into that somewhere, and that's what he'd become. He was, he was, he was worse. We'll, get with that. we'll go with that later. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm talking too fast. <sighs> I agree with Paul when he made this statement. We usually don't make it until the third and fourth, or until the third generation, because by the third generation, they aren't hungry. What did we start with? Jesus invited them, told the story he was inviting them to a meal. He was inviting them to come on this journey. Come, come sup with me. It's the third meal of the day. Isn't that when he walked and talked with Adam in the garden, in the evening? 
He said, come, come sup with me. Come, come rest with me. Come in the evening. Come spend time with me. Let's just walk this life out together. Let's, let's have this relationship. And these people begin to make excuses. Well, I've got too much stuff. I've got, I've got this going on right now, and I can't, I can't really get involved in this relationship. And I'm not talking about church attendance. I could really hone that right there. <laughs> yeah. I've got sports we've got to play on Sunday now I, or, or Wednesday, whatever it is. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the relationship. We don't make it to the third generation because the third generation, they're not hungry. And I begin to think just in my lifetime. I was driving down the road. This would have been in 2000. I quit my job in 98. This would have been 99. 99, I was between Miami, Oklahoma, and on my way back and forth to Bentonville. I was having to drive back to go back to work. We were getting ready to move back there at at one season there. And I was driving down the road, and the Lord spoke to me just as clear, not audibly, but to my heart, as clear as I've ever heard him. He said that what happened with the Depression generation to the baby boomer generation to my generation, financially, economically, in that sect, happened in the church spiritually the same. And I thought, what in the world? And I started thinking about the Depression generation. Those people had to pray every meal on the table. The dirty 30s people. They built some of the biggest bridges and skyscraper things that we still have today back then. If you go across the Royal Gorge and read when it was built and who built it and how they built it, that was amazing. They didn't have the equipment we have today. They didn't have the computers and the technology today. Somebody sat down with a pencil and paper and figured up how many little wires that you had to have to run all the way across that canyon and build this big wire cable that would hold a bridge and all that suspension. Think about all the figuring that had to go on and then all the work to go down through that thing and to do that or to the Brooklyn Bridge. I have that hanging in my office. You guys have heard me teach about bridges. I love that stuff. The, the, what it took to build some of the greatest monuments and the greatest skyscrapers and things. That generation was going through one of the hardest times economically in, the, in, in American history, but yet they built some of the greatest things ever. And then you have the boomer generation after that. They, they experienced the biggest economic boom ever in American history. They saw the greatest growth. They grew up in church where parents were at prayer night. Parents prayed. They had serious prayer. Not just at church, but over their table and their meals every day. They had to seek the Lord. There were so many things like that. And then then they they have all this, this opportunity. I watched it in my dad's life. My grandpa would tell my dad, my dad was laying carpet in Colorado at the time, and he could, he could have all the work he wanted. My grandpa would tell him on Saturdays, he'd say, man, son, you need to work Saturday. And dad, you know, dad kind of thinking about taking off or spending time. Dad loved to go to the mountains. And my grandpa would always try to get him to work because he, in his mind, if you could work one day and make that much money, that was more money than he would work maybe for a whole month. And so in his mind, it's like, man, you need to take this opportunity. It won't always be here. And so they would push them. And so the grandparents would watch the kids so the parents could work. And I'm not not picking on, on, on my family or being mean or anything like that. But what happened was you had these deacons and elders in the church of that generation, the, the, the depression generation. They knew how to get a hold of God. They'd come to the altar and stay there till God moved or till God spoke or till they got an answer or whatever it was. They, they knew how to pray. And then they had a set of kids and then their kids were experiencing all this, all this growth and all this opportunity and stuff. And so when it come time to make the transition in the church, oh, 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 deacon so-and-so son, well, you know, Johnny's got, he's successful at business. We ought to put him in charge. He ought to be a deacon. He ought to be an elder. But he didn't have the hunger. He didn't have the relationship. Grandpa did. You see, are you with me? See where I'm going? And so, and so then it become more about a business deal than whether or not God spoke. Are we walking with him or are we reasoning it? And this, this digression starts. And then you got my generation that come up. My generation was called Generation X. We didn't know what we were. Still, still wonder sometimes. <laughs> And I watched it in my life. So you got the depression generation, the boomer generation, and then 
my generation, the X generation. And that digression happened. And I'm not, I'm not saying it was that way with everybody. There's good people in every one of them. But there was a lot of that kind of stuff. I can see how that happens. I look at families that have a lot of wealth and money and power. And they, they've got this strength. They've got this work ethic. And they, they build, whether it's a, a, a dynasty or whatever it is, and then their sons or their daughters take over that thing. And by the third generation, I mean, I can name some companies that I know and watch the digression of morals and value until it's become nothing more than a third generation. It's gone. It could be because the third generation had nothing to earn or work for. And you know, I'm not talking about work spiritually with God, but they're not hungry. Never, they weren't hungry. They were never allowed to fail. You ever been around someone whose parents never allowed their kid to fail? Never allowed it to be their fault? Everybody's a winner. I remember when that first started, Jessica was about this high. And we, they started playing sports, and we went to this thing, and it's like, nobody kept score. Everybody's a winner. And I'm like, what? And then they're like, well, yeah, these kids, you don't want these kids to feel bad because they lost. And I'm like, well, why not? I mean, gives them motivation. They're like, no, we don't want little Johnny or Susie to cry. So they all got a participation trophy. And guess, look where we're at. You want to just look around and see where we're at in our country? Why? Because we never let them fail. We never let them fall. We never let them get hurt. We, were, we padded everything. I mean, if you want some real comedy, funny stuff, settle down. If you want some funny stuff, listen to, uh, no, I shouldn't do that. Jeff Foxworthy talk about <laughs> child-proofing their home. You know, when we were kids, we had a TV that weighed 200 pounds on a TV tray. You know, knock that dude over. Somebody's going to the hospital with broken bones. Not today. We've got it bolted to the wall, padding around the edge of everything, you know, so our kids don't get hurt. My parents were like, <laughs> you run into something, they're like, that hurt? Yeah, well, don't do it again. That's how my dad taught me to keep my horse off the barrels. <laughs> One time I had this horse, and he would fly, and I, I was seven. <laughs> So going around a barrel, and he hit the barrel and busted my leg open. And I'm crying. I get back to the end. And he said, you break your leg? I said, I think so. And he said, good, run it again. You'll keep him off of it this time. Sorry, Dad. Thank you, Dad. I sincerely mean that. People say, well, that's child abuse. No, I kept him off the barrel. And I lived. I got seven stitches. But I lived. Amen. It made me tougher. It made me endure pain and realize, you know what, I can bleed and still work. I, I can be hurt and it's okay. Amen? Instead of, oh, my God, I broke a nail. I guess I got to get off some of this stuff. They squander the wealth, the wealth that was laid out before them because they were never allowed to earn it. They were never allowed to have to work or to deal with pain or to, to deal with issues or go through hard times. God, how many know God's a good father? He'll actually let us go through hard times. That's what's wrong with this candy Christianity that people preach. They, they preach that to people that God's just going to make everything great. No, He's not. Matter of fact, God might send you right into the fire. He might send you in a situation that you didn't do a thing wrong. You did everything right, and He just let you walk right in. Why? Because He had faith you'd walk right on through it, and you'd come out the other side, and you'd keep your horse off the barrel next time, even though it wasn't even your fault. Amen? I don't know about you, that's good news to me. If you find yourself in this place of complacency, feeling stuck, no drive, no hunger, etc., you might get ready to experience, sometimes by choice and sometimes not. If you're hungry and you answer the invitation, you might have to get out from under daddy's umbrella. You might have to make a change and leave the place where you're at. You might have to. It might be a mindset that you need to leave. It might be a, a relationship with friends or different people in your life that you've hung around. It might be time to come out from there because God's going to take you on another place. It might be leaving a job or career. I just spent 30 minutes on the phone before I come to church of, of a family that just went through something that they didn't do. They were accused of something. They had nothing to do one of the spouse's lives was basically destroyed. 
reputably. Didn't do a thing, and now it's, now it's coming out that, they didn't, that she didn't do anything. Lost her job. Won't ever be able to go back. But through this, God's been faithful. Through the stuff they've went through, God's been faithful. As a matter of fact, he's setting them up, and they're going to come out of this better than they ever went before. But they went through it. Amen? Because they were on a journey. They started committing to God. We're going to start getting our life together. We're going to start start going to church. We're going to start doing this. I I always kind of cringe when I see people make that decision because I'm thinking, buckle up. Hope somebody didn't tell you it was going to be a bed of roses with this Christian thing because when you really commit to God, stuff begins to change. And we'll get back into that when I get back on wells because I want to talk about that well of contention. When you get into the Word, you may have to leave what's familiar. You may have to leave some kinfolk. Some of your family might not understand this walk that you're on with God. Anybody ever had some of your family not understand what you were doing? You might have to leave a certain place and follow that voice. But I promise you, it'll be like we talk Sunday. It's nevertheless. It's nevertheless. It's not a bad thing. It's a way of living and a ride that you don't want to miss, that you don't want to miss out on. You don't want to just die on the road. Let's be a generation that starts out. Let's not be the generation that starts out and never enters in. Let's be the generation that exemplifies the hunger and allows our children to see us go through hard times and come out the other side and see what God did in all of it so they won't be afraid when they go through those kinds of things. Amen? One of the hardest things Cassie and I ever did, and I'll close with this. What do we got? Three minutes? Cassie and I ever did was walk away from her dad's church, and start a church right down the road. She was his piano player since she was 12. And we had to, we had to, God spoke to us to leave, and we, we went to another church for a while, and then, uh, then he, he told us to start a church, and we started a church in a house right down the road from there. And it was hard. And she really struggled, and she was reading her Bible one day, and she come across that verse where it says that if you don't hate your father and mother, you're not even worthy to be called mine. That's pretty hard. And she began to weep, and God spoke to her, and he said, I'm not asking you to hate them. I'm just asking you, will you put me in front of them? Will we put God in front of our kids? Will we say, God, I'm going to serve you even if my kids don't understand it. I'm going to go where you tell me to go. I'm going to do what you tell me to do even if my parents don't understand. You don't know how many times I have people tell me I'd love to come to your church, but my family wouldn't like it. I just don't want to hurt my parents' feelings. And I'm not trying to. I've been there. We've done it. But I challenge you, if that's you, take the invitation. You might be surprised who goes with you. Amen. You might be surprised that the people in your life that are waiting on you to move that want to go with you. And little did we know when we walked away from that situation with her dad and his church and went to another one for a while, and then we ended up starting one, and then we come back. God was building our life and teaching us and training us to where we would come back and take his church back and come back and fill in for him while he passed away for a year with cancer. And then we were able to hand that off to someone else, which fulfilled a 23-year-old dream of her mother's. We would have never been able to do that had we not left and went on that journey. Because we wouldn't have been in the mental state, we wouldn't have been in the spiritual state of our life, we wouldn't have understand the power of just obeying God and trusting whatever He did, whether we could see it or not, because you never get to see what happened before until after you step. It was after We made the commitment and gave it away that her mom sat with me in the back room with tears running down her face and said, this is the Lord. I had this dream 20 some years ago and this room was full of dark eyed kids, dark haired kids with dark eyes. This is God. What a ride. What a ride. 
And now because of that one, they've been able to start three more churches out of that one. They bought another friend of mine's church, the old church, when they built a new church. Now there's all these other Spanish churches. It was a fulfillment of a dream that God gave my mother-in-law. Had nothing to do with us. We were just on that journey, just on that ride. We got to stop. Accept the invitation. Come to the meal. Because it's not just about the meal. It's about the walk. And you will not be disappointed. Father, I praise you for the truth of your word. I praise you for the fact that your word does not return void. And when you speak to us and you invite us to take this journey with you and to go on this walk with you, man, it's a ride. It's a faith walk. It's like Abram. You might even change our whole identity. You did it all through his generations. But because he stepped out, because he obeyed you, you gave him the promise that his descendants would be as the the stars of heaven and the sand of the seashores. God, help us to walk in that kind of faith, I pray. Help us to realize that we have a covenant with you that's much like Abram's. And that we can walk in that confidence of knowing that you've already seen the future and you know what you want to do. You're just giving us the opportunity to come on and go on that ride with you and to go on that walk and have that relationship. And I praise you for that. And I just pray that people's faith has been encouraged and strengthened tonight to just go with you on whatever you're telling them to do. And I give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen.